Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Abha, and with me here is Team 12 Stat 791, Iterative Intentions from Flower Mound, Texas. They are your Houston Center Stage World Championship Inspire Award winner. They were also the winning, the part of the winning alliance out of the Jemison division, uh, just losing narrowly in their finals. And then after that, at the Texas State Championship, they were also the winning, uh, winning alliance first pick and Inspire Award winner. They've just had an absolutely fantastic season. Their robot is so incredibly fast. And I think there's just so much to learn uh, from this team and everyone will take something away from this behind the ball. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. The new Robit system by Anymark can reduce complexity and enable robust builds. Parts align to a common one half inch grid, simplifying construction and allowing alignment of both structure and motion components. Robits enables teams to always have the parts they need to complete a build. Head on over to Anymark.com slash Robits to learn more in order today. Support Fun's content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and Fun members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the Join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Okay guys, so let's get started with, in general, your approach to the center stage season. I think the Texas uh, like system has a lot more competition than other regions do. So walk me through your approach to the center stage game in general. Yes, this year we wanted to have a very versatile bot that could complete all of the tasks. We wanted to be able to score on the backboard, pick up from the stacks, pick up from the wings, adjust pixels on the backboard, and obviously hang and drop. So we wanted to be a very versatile uh, teammate uh, so that we could partner well with any of our partners. Similarly, contrary to last year, we wanted to have a much more simpler and a robust design challenge or design robot. This year we went with trying to go for the lightest robot possible and using the least amount of resources possible because there's so many competitions in Texas. We knew we wouldn't have so much time in between our competitions. So we know that our robot had to be reliable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so like talking about that in regards to your drive train specifically, I know last year you guys tried like maybe a butterfly or an octocanum and a bunch of things like that. This year, what was your approach uh, for the drive train? If you could walk me through that quickly. This year, we wanted to go remove all of the me mechanical complexity from an octocanum. And we, we did have an octocanum mainly because it would make our robot slightly too large than what we wanted it to, and it would also be too heavy. So we have a standard parallel plate drivetrain that encompasses all of uh, six out of the seven motors on our drivetrain uh, on our robot. So we have our two slide motors that are nested in this channel. And we also have our four drivetrain motors towards the front to offset the motors, uh, to offset the weight at the back of our robots from our deposit. Um, and we also wanted to have our robot, uh, I mean, our motors as low to the ground as possible so that we had in our grip. Yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense. And like talking a little bit uh, about like iterations for your drivetrain, has it changed at all throughout the season or was that something that was just kind of one and done uh, in the beginning? I think the drivetrain was probably the most one and done part mm -hmm. of our season. We didn't change it much at all. The only thing that we changed is in the back, you can see we added this pixel pusher uh, so that we could drop the purple pixel throughout the back instead of flipping over our arm. Sure. Yeah, now talking about things that like may have been iterated upon more, changed more throughout the season, going to your claws, you know, I think a lot of teams uh, have been deciding this season whether to do an active intake or do a claw. Um, what is your guys's thought process on that. Why did you go with the claw instead of an active intake? So the main reason we went with the claw is because we didn't want to have a transfer. Last year, we also had a success with the transfer with design because it, minimates, uh, it minimizes one portion of mechanical complexity. So our claw acts as our intake as well as our deposit. And additionally, if we fold in our arms, we can also adjust pixels using this metal spoke. So that was probably the biggest advantages to having a claw in the season is we wanted to have a very light and efficient mechanism so instead of having two and it take and a deposit, we only have one. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. And uh, like, did you guys also prototype any active intakes throughout the season and you decided you didn't want to do it? Or was it more based off of like what other teams had done? How did you, uh, like what was the basis behind that decision? Originally we had an active intake, but we had some problems getting the transfer to be consistent. And we also realized that the transfer time could have been slow. The reason why we just scrapped our active intake and just went to a claw is because we realized throughout the competitions, we can actually optimize our claw instead of having a separate mechanism. And we also knew that the claw was amazing for grabbing at the stacks 
and it was a really great and simple deposit. Yeah, and so uh, talking about that stack graph just a little bit, are, are you guys doing it like where you grab both pixels with one side of your pod? Do you grab each pixel individually? Walk me through that. Yes, so we grab both pixels um, on one side of the claw mm -hmm. and it allows us to instantaneously grab them stacks. Another cool thing that we changed is you can actually see on the claw, we have one, the top portion of the claw is very small, mm -hmm. but the bottom portion of the claw is very long. So when we deposit in the back, uh, the top portion will actually drop first and then the bottom one will drop after the top one. So both pixels will drop on the board, not one on the board and one on the floor. That, that, that's really cool. Yeah, I think that's something teams have struggled with a lot. And like one thing other that I that I really liked about your call I noticed is you guys dropped the pixels kind of like upside down, uh, if you will. And so it was that something you tried like dropping them right side up the first time and you just realized you weren't getting great drops or have you just had that from the beginning? Yeah, so originally, yeah. Originally we did drop like this. The problem mm -hmm. with that, realize sometimes the pixel would get stuck at an angle and then we have to move back in order to drop it and that would cause the pixel to tumble. Um, in order to fix this, we had to remove all the grip from our claw uh, mm -hmm. so it would slide uh, freely, but that would reduce our intaking capabilities. So one thing that we added I, that I think is pretty unique is you can see in the claw we have these divots. And the reason why we have these divots is because the divots will fold into the section of the arm and the chain. So this allows us to get a very deep or allows us to flip our claw back Mm -hmm. um in order to score on the backboard at a 60 degree angle wow yeah that that's really really clever and uh you know like while you guys have like those really high quality shots uh, of the claw there i couldn't help but notice those uh sensors you have going on so walk me through what you use those sensors for and like when you added them so after a regionals competition we realized we were very slow in the tele -off period and it was very hard for our drivers to look at those pixels from so far away and then take them. So one thing that we added right before a state competition is these Pololu five centimeter distance sensors, which can, if you can turn it on, they can automatically sense when there's a pixel inside the clock. So as you can see, uh, they can sense it. And also what we did in order to help our drivers see when there's a, when the claw is actually clawed something is we, you can see in the back, we have these two LED indicators and they, they correspond to the left side of the claw and the right side of the claw. So it makes it very easy for the drivers to see when they have a claw and to move back. You want to take yeah. yeah. And so uh, like a little bit about the programming there was like, were there any complex algorithms or any filtering you had to do with the sensors or was it really like a very simple implementation, something you would recommend for a lot of teams? Yeah, so these sensors, uh, because of the fact that they're digital ports, they only give a true or false value if they mm -hmm. see a pixel. And so luckily when we implemented them, we didn't have to worry about having to calculate the velocity of a robot relative to the pixel or anything like that. Mm -hmm. All we had to do is, if we detect a pixel, uh, delay it for like a few milliseconds just to give it time to get into the claw safely and then grab it. Or if we don't detect a pixel, just let go so we can pick one up whenever we can. Sure. Yeah, and now going on to your guys' arm, definitely noticed a lot of really cool things there uh, that I want to jump into. But first, if you can give us an overview, that'd be appreciated. Yeah, so this year we went with the differential arm system. And the reason why we did that is we didn't want to have additional servos on the arm in order to pitch the wrist. Mm -hmm. So the way the differential works is it has these two gears. And when these gears move in the opposite rotation, the bevel gears will rotate and it would cause the wrist to rotate. However, what happens when they move in the same direction? So what happens is that this middle gear is unable to rotate anymore because that's just how gears work. And that um, rotation causes the entire pivot to rotate. Mm -hmm. So it stalls that inner two gears in order to make sure that the arm rotates. So this allows us to um, minimize the weight on the arm, which allows for in turn a longer arm. So we have only two servos to power both this very long arm and it will also power our wrist. Yeah, and as far as materials go, uh, like, what is your arm made out of? Uh, like, is it 3D printed or aluminum, carbon fiber? Go ahead. Yes, so we wanted our arm to be as light as possible. So we went with carbon fiber nylon. Mm -hmm. But the reason why we didn't go with just carbon fiber is because most of our parts are actually 3D. So definitely the arm is less stiff, but we knew that we could just support it evenly to make a very light, uh, long, and robust arm. Yeah, and uh, as far as like the gears go, I definitely saw like some pretty standard like Go Builder Servo City gears, but the smaller and thinner ones inside the gearbox itself for the differential, are those 3D printed or what are they? 
So these are axon gears, and the reason why we did this is it allows us to maintain the uh, same amount of torque as the axon to go into the pivot because the pivot requires more torque than the wrist. We wanted our wrist to be faster, so the axons are a 2.88 to 1 reduction. So this allows us our wrist to be almost three times as fast as our pitch. Yeah, that, that's really awesome. And so from a programming perspective, are you guys just like using like pretty much uh, predefined positions to set different things to? Or do you have like, have you done like the inverse kinematics uh, for, for, the, for the differential? Yeah, so originally we tried to do the inverse kinematics, but we realized that this is a really precise mechanism, especially when you're doing stuff like intaking from the stack. So we, so we decided to just switch over to predefined positions and then we can just, because then we can just precisely tune them whenever we need to and make sure they're as accurate as possible. Sure, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Now, I know you mentioned that you had uh, like six out of your seven motors in your drivetrain base, so I, I guess we'll get to the last one in a bit, but before, uh, let's talk about your lift. You said it's powered by two motors, so walk us through uh, like your entire lift subsystem and I'll ask some more questions after Yeah, that. so I can flip it over on this side. Um, so our lift is very compact. It uses these two motors that are nested inside of the channel and they're geared to the central shaft. The central shaft composes of these four pulleys, which power our slides. Mm -hmm. So as the, the slides me mechanism had to be really compact because it only had this much space. So we went with the bearings being aligned like this. These are BWT slides, so they're very, very compact. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a rail at the last stage. Um, and the reason why we went with this is so that our arm wouldn't be like in in the middle of the slide, it could be always at the end, which would be easier for deposit. Right, and you wouldn't have like a javelin or anything sticking out. Um, yes. Past, right. And so uh, for the slide, like what type of sensors are you using? Is it just the relative encoders on the motors or do you have to have other uh, sensors as well? Yes, yeah, so for the slides, we just use the encoder from one of the motors. Uh, we plug it into our PID algorithm that sends the power to both motors so they stay in sync. Mm -hmm. And because they're mechanically linked, uh, they can't go out of sync. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I guess one other question about your arm, now seeing like how long it is uh, on camera, definitely like from a further perspective, it's really impressive. So for that, do you have to motion profile uh, the servo motion at all? Or is it just like standard set to position for the servo? Yes, we do motion profile it with a asynchronous motion profiler. It's pretty simple. Uh, the reason why we did this is a non-motion profile works, but it was very jerky. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, because the arm is pretty long, it would slam into the ground, mm -hmm. which we didn't want. Mm -hmm. So we went with the motion profiler in order to smooth the differential's actions. Yeah. And also, like with that, are you using the fourth like wire for the analog sensor for the axon, or are you just using three wires and trusting the position? Yes, we're just trusting the position. We're not using that fourth wire. We wanted to reduce wire complexity on our lift. Sure. And now, I guess going to like your end game things. You said you have six out of your seven motors in your drivetrain. What was the last motor uh, that that you guys haven't talked about yet? So our final motor uh, is for the drone mechanism. Uh, mm -hmm. Contrary to the typical constant four springs or rubber bands that are used for the drone, we use a flywheel shooter. The oh, reason wow. why we is we realized it would be very, very accurate if we can make sure our motor uh, moves at the same rate whenever we're shooting. And this allows us, this allowed us to get a 25 zone one drone streak from our regional competition all the way to Texas State Championship, uh, which was really good for us. It allows us to get that 30 points, which is really, really hard to get. And mm -hmm. it decides a lot of our matches. Yeah, that, that's really awesome. And so uh, talking a little bit about that flywheel shooter, was was that something like you guys tried a lot of the rubber band designs, constant force springs, all of those things, and you realized like this is just really good or what led you to this flywheel design? Yes, so our first initial thought is what's the flywheel design? And we used it for all of our league tournaments on a separate robot that we built. Mm -hmm. um, but we wanted our robot, obviously, to be as light as possible. So we experimented with the servo rubber band shooting technique. Um, we found it to be very inconsistent. And we knew that if there was any changes within the AC or anything like that, it would cause inconsistencies. And uh, the drone matters so much in the game. I mean, 10 points is a lot, whether it's zone two or zone three. So we wanted to make sure, even if our robot was just slightly heavier, we wanted to make sure we can consistently score that zone one drill. Sure, and just talking a little bit more about that. So is it just a motor for the mechanism or do you also have a servo to kind of load the drone into the into the flywheel at the correct time? Um, no, it's just the motor. The ramp up time is fast enough and it will just immediately shoot the drone 
far away as possible. It was pretty surprising that it worked. We initially we initially thought we needed to rev up the motor and then shoot it in, but it worked, so we just kept it as is. Awesome, yeah. And now talking a little bit uh, about like looking forward uh, to the offseason, you guys are competing at the Maryland Tech Invitational. Clearly, the robot you have now works very, very well. Uh, are there any changes you plan on making, or changes you would want to make, uh, like in the future? Any anything like that? I think the biggest change that we'll be making is just tweaking our autonomous to be more accurate and giving some more practice to our drivers. Mm -hmm. um, especially since we're just heading into this competition, we are very confident that our robot will do well. It hasn't failed us for the past couple of competitions, so we're really happy. With it. Um, but it's more about optimizing, just driving better, getting a, comp a competitive feel for such a competitive event, such mm -hmm. as MTI. Mm -hmm. We just want to make sure we're tweaking everything, making sure everything works, running through everything to see if anything will go wrong on the robot and how we can fix it. But it's all about optimization until MTI. Yeah, awesome. Well, iterative intention, thank you guys so much. I mean, you've just had an absolutely standout season, like just constantly uh, performing at the highest level every competition. It's been a pleasure watching you guys and also interviewing you guys. Uh, I think teams are really going to learn a lot from your claw and just general approach to the game this season. So thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you guys at MTI. Um, and until then, I'm Abbas reporting for First Updates Now. And this is Team 12791, Iterative Intention. Thank you. Thank you. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. The new Robit system by Anymark can reduce complexity and enable robust builds. Parts align to a common one half inch grid, simplifying construction and allowing alignment of both structure and motion components. Robits enables teams to always have the parts they need to complete a build. Head on over to Anymark.com slash Robits to learn more in order today. Don't forget to like, subscribe and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.